Here, here. Come, come witness the tale of a lone Mesa developer who, after the 101st regression caused by external changes, vowed to slay the bisection dragon once and for all by guarding their driver kingdom with CI pre-merge testing. Da -da 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 -da. Ever since I, ever since I landed support for my driver in Mesa, um, I've been spending more and more of my time fighting regressions instead of adding features. I'm fed up with manual testing. I need to figure out a way to invest on CI. So what's the minimum amount of work I can do to just run my test scripts on, the, uh, on, the, on my dots uh, from GitLab? Um, so <laughs> I could just use the GitLab runner directly um, it's the minimum amount of work, so it's been working. Let's see how stable it is so I can go from just post-merge to pre-merge. So after a while, it's been, it's been stable for weeks, but now the jobs are suddenly failing. But it's fixed after a reboot. This is weird. And now it's broken again? What's going on? All right. Um you know, someone just tried on your device some unstable, you know, build and it broke your GPU state. But, you know, it's like you work from home, right? So you will just go to your device and turn it off and on again, right? No problems, right? Okay, uh, but now my that doesn't boot anymore. Oh, right. So, um... Yeah, what happened is that the uh, developer decided to test an, uh, an LC1 kernel, Linux kernel, and then there was an XFS uh, or X4 regression, and it just corrupted your drive. Ha <laughs> ha, just reinstall everything and you're done. Okay. Well, now this is a weird one. The tests, uh, random tests are failing, and there doesn't seem to be any pattern in the job. Don't worry. It's not your fault. Um, it's just, you know, some developer tested some feature and it changed the GPU state and now it's in the state of wrongly set up GPU, but you're testing something, so it's failing, yeah. you know. Okay, that's great. So now I installed some security updates, but my network doesn't work anymore. How do I get back to a working state? Right, um, well, the uh, I mean, you need to figure out what package actually broke uh, your testing, and then you need to revert that and uh, pray that everything works again. Okay, that's good. And now someone keeps pushing a fake job that's just installing a cryptocurrency miner. I keep killing it, but it comes back. All right. Uh, well, your machine is compromised, so have a fun reinstalling it and you know wiping clean and take care of, take care about it. Um. Okay. Well. Okay. But now many machines are running twenty four sevens twenty four seven to wait for a job to arrive, and that consumes a lot of electricity. And it's just heating up my apartment where there's already another heat wave starting. Yeah, that's the problem when you run the GitLab runner directly on your test devices and let them idle uh, when they are not being used. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, that doesn't seem worth it. Okay, so clearly I need a stable environment so that I can rely on its state and um, make sure I can test it before I push it to prods because, and, and uh, if I make a mistake, I need to be able to revert. Um, and yeah, the, the dot, it needs to be in a clean state, uh, so I need to parrot it down before each job, I mean, uh, yeah, it has to be already powered down when I start the, the job so that I can just boot it from a clean slate. Um, so I guess I need to boot it on demand. I, I think I need an infrastructure for this, I can't do it just with GitLab runner directly. Does Mesa have something to do, uh, something to do that? Yeah, sure, Eric. Um, but you will need a few things which you need to set up. So first, you need a gateway, so you can connect uh, 
gateway to device under the test and do the testing itself. Uh, you will also need like some serial ports to be able to send commands and retrieve output of these commands. And of course, you will need uh, PDUs uh, to devices to shut down and power on to devices when you need them. And of course, some network switch so you can like communicate, download uh, containers and rootfs and everything, right? Okay, well, that's not too bad. I already have most of these anyway. Right, but then when you start using an infrastructure, then uh, you get a new set of challenges. One of them is that you're going to stress test your the boot uh, of your devices. So if they don't boot reliably, then you're in, in for a treat. Um, also, additionally, um, I mean, the, the nice part that's, uh, is that you're going to be having a very spiky load. So by default, when the machine is not, isn't used, then you consume about 60 watts, not bad. And then whenever the machines are working, then you can go up to 600. So yeah, you are idling at 10%, so not too bad. Um, and then next, uh, the problem is that if your device is relying on a battery, like for instance, or here a Steam Deck or a laptop or a phone, then uh, if the battery is still connected, then if you want to force it, uh, want to shut it down the machine and guarantee that you can shut it down, then you can just disconnect it from the power using the PDU. It's going to keep on running for, well, if it's an Apple M1, then probably about a day or two. So you don't want to wait that long. So you want to be able to cut the power when you need to. So what you do is, A, you literally cut the wire. And then you connect it to a relay that you control using another uh, uh, cable, which is basically connected to the power supply through, for instance, a, you know, a USB charger. And this is how you automate testing on battery-operated devices. But that's more work. So, um, so I have the bare metal infrastructure, so what's going to happen if my CI gateway won't start after the update, right? So, I will have to go there, I will have to fix it manually, that's not that great, right? And another thing, I for device under the test, since I recently built my lab grid setup, which originally should be one of the part of the stock, is like you need to write all the configuration by hand in the config files and you have to be very careful which cable, which serial cable connect to which device and you know if you need to replace something it's pretty annoying yeah so if you switch the cables it's like some device randomly is starting getting some output of commands and boot and you're thinking what's what's happened right so and also you need to, to maintain the configuration of each device so this is one example how it can look and for each device you you have one of this file so that's not that appealing right yeah okay i think we need to split out the the configuration and the everything for the infrastructure away from the the code uh, so away from the the device so that it's um, um, factored out away from the project that is being tested yeah. So rather than duplicating the same code in every single project, uh, then you just have it in one place and then you just talk to this infrastructure. And maintaining all of that configuration for each device by hand, that's too much work. We're going to make mistakes. It's not going to work. We need to auto-discover the machines, verify at boot that the machine hasn't been, like you haven't swapped the GPU while the machine was off. All of that needs to be automated. We can't do that by hand. And that rootfs deployment, like having to transfer the, the data over the, the um, NFS uh, between the, the gateway and the dot, that's just slow and that's, that doesn't work. Bare metal is a, has some trade-off, but that's not really that much better. Do we have something else in Mesa? Okay, so we have Lava, right? And with Lava, it solves some issues like prioritization, and the configuration is a little bit nicer than for bare metal. But still, um, 
right, new slide. So uh, uh, still you need separate um, the duties, uh, you need generate root FS, you need to work with templates. So for example, if you're booting different devices uh, with for some devices with U-boot, so some devices with fast boot, you need alternative templates for each device. So that's not that much fun. And uh, what is missing in Lava, and we missed that a lot, is like, for example, the interactive session where you can like connect to the device and look what's happening and interact with it. Just not retrying the job again and waiting until it starts and test your changes. So uh, it has some drawbacks. Okay, so that doesn't really fit what I want. What I really want is like a system that's just simple. Just keep it stupid simple. I want a simple dashboard that just tells me what the devices, what the, the test devices I have that are connected. I, I want to just use the, the same job description as GitLab, not a custom one. I, I want everything on my device to be automatically discovered. Like if I change something, I want that. To, I don't want to do anything manually, um, which also means I, I need to um, to not have to, to care about how to boot the, the device, um, and I need automatically to to have automatic monitoring as well, so that I don't have to keep an eye on every device to see when something goes wrong. And I really want to just be able, if, if there's a job that fails on the, the CI, I want to just be able to, with a simple command, just run that locally without having to just construct by hand a ton of things. Um, and yeah, so containers, that seems to fit some of that. I can uh, have the, um, um, the, the boot process is standardized if it's just a Docker image that I boot. And I can do that on the, the, the dots that I test, but it would be good to also have that on the gateway so that I don't have to maintain the gateway by hand. And that way I can just test one image on the, the gateway and if there's an issue, I can just roll back to the previous image and I'm done. And yeah, in interactive session, that would be really nice. Like if there's a job that's failing, instead of just retrying, like you said, just connect to the job while it's running and see what's going on on it or just take over the, that device because it, something's wrong with that device. So I'm not gonna run it on the, the CI anymore. I'm just gonna run something myself, uh, type my commands and figure things out, but without having the CI using it. And yeah, it would be nice to be, to be able to use it from GitLab, but also from GitHub, source hurts or anything else. And I really want my, the, um, the jobs from March to come first so that if uh, there's a bunch of users that are testing things, they're not gonna prevent the people who want to merge something. So there needs to be prioritization that actually takes March before everything else. And if we have some like long job that's running in the, the background and it's like a nightly job or something like that and someone wants to merge something, I need to kill the, the, the nightly job, run the, the March job, but then I want to just resume, not have to restart the, the three hour job that was killed after two and a half hours. So I want to be able to just preempt the job, like kill it, but then resume and not restart. So yeah, about that, uh, here is CITRON. And now you can see the lemon part that I was talking about. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so in CITRON we have quite a few things out of this. So we have this nice and simple dashboard, as you'll see in a second. Unfortunately, we don't have yet the Forge Native job description format, but the entire architecture of the project is geared towards this. So that's not next on our to-do list, but the, the one right after. Then uh, automatic discovery and recovery of, of uh, devices under test. Yep, that's there. Since day zero, I don't trust myself to, you know, when you have 10 machines and then uh, you think you're modifying test machine three, but you're actually modifying test machine four, then you've got two GPUs that look pretty much exactly the same and you plug just one that you think is the right one, but then you plug the wrong one. This is not, you know, like hypothetical. This is happening all the time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, so this is 
something that I don't trust myself with and I don't have to. Then uh, the boot standardization, uh, this is something that, um, so we ended up going for Pixie booting or iPixie. So uh, Pixie is basically what people call net booting, right? And uh, iPixie is just a super a cool bootloader. And uh, if your board doesn't have support for it, then you can flash, let's say, uBoot. Uh, that just runs IPXC as an EFI uh, uh, bootloader. And so it's fine. So the test projects don't have to know how to boot the machine. Uh, this is something that the dot itself should be configured to do. Then, well, automatic monitoring. So both of the, the gateways in the test machines, whenever they run a job, then they are just going to send uh, statistics about their CPU usage or RAM or... Um, GTT utilization, I don't know, whatever you want. It's there. Uh, then being able to run the CI job in an identical environment. So for instance, in Mesa CI, we just output the, uh, the job description, and then you just copy that. And then you run the same common line that, uh, that was used. So that's a, a single line, so it's pretty good. Then uh, we run containers with everything. Uh, the way we boot these containers is through an initramfs that uh, that we created. It's called boot to container. So it's 20 megs. So you just download it every single time, and it stays in RAM. So it, uh, if it gets corrupted by, let's say, a kernel that is uh, unreleased and uh, you know X with X4 uh, uh, corruption issues, then doesn't matter. Uh, the the drive is only used for one thing, it's just caching, and if it doesn't work, if the cache is corrupted, it's just gonna nuke it and start again. Doesn't matter, it's just a performance improvement. It is not, uh, yeah, it is not something that you have to, to have. Um, yeah, so changing, uh, testing ahead of uh, production. We have a CI system for our CI system. Whenever you send a, a merge request to, our, to CITRON, it's gonna deploy a virtual environment that just has virtual dots that are gonna be booted and tested and, uh, and uh, the entire life cycle of, uh, of machines is, uh, is tested like this and if it passes then probably good. And um, we're not done with that yet but uh, we have a branch where we even test GitLab jobs from this GitLab job. So it just, you know, a bit more meta. <laughs> So that's how you test from end to end uh, the entire system ahead of production. I'm fed up with working, uh, like hacking in production. That is not okay. Then, um, usable from multiple instances of uh, GitLab, so that is done. So you can expose your dots on multiple um, farms, uh, not farms, like GitLab instances. So in gitlab.com and then freedesktop.gitlab.org, for instance. Oh, uh, the opposite. <laughs> Uh, GitHub is not done yet, but this is uh, on the roadmap. Source Hut is an example, and then, I don't know, GTA, whatever. Uh, the objective would be that you don't even need to do anything. It would just be using the Forge native job description. But it takes a little bit of time because you need to re-implement the, uh, the, the, the runner. So, But that's doable. Simon did it, so he gave me a pep talk. <laughs> then... Um, to prioritize uh, jobs for, for instance, Marge, so Mesa CI's uh, workflow, um, or Mesa's workflow. Um, this is in progress. Uh, we have a solution that is generic for everyone, and then we'll have to adapt it for CITRON to make it even more powerful. And then, um, finally, the job preemption. This is something that was uh, designed from the beginning, uh, but uh, we have not worked on the interruption yet, but the resumed part is, is there. So that means that, uh, for instance, in some test suites, if your test suite supports resuming, then you can already, uh, uh, if the machine hangs, it can reboot and continue from where it left off. So that with Piglet or IGT, uh, this is supported. But for Mesa CI, which is using the EQP runner, there's no support for this yet, but we'll had need to add support to it for it. And uh, yeah, so now let's have a look a bit at how it looks. So this is uh, an old photo of my farm. Now it is a little more crowded. This, that was the first three devices that I put. Now here we've got about uh, uh, eight Steam decks. <laughs> but it was too messy, so it just went for the old photo. 
So what do you see? You have a gateway here um, that is controlling uh, the PDU here that you can see, not. <laughs> uh, here you've got the network. And then, um, so of course you can control the, the gateway and uh, the test machines using a KVM screen and keyboard. So that's practical if you want to see what is going on. Of course, on laptops, it's very nice because you don't have to stay on Steam Decks. Uh, yeah, and that's all there is. So every dot needs three things, power, uh, serial, and Ethernet. So that's it. That's what you find here. Oh, you need to be... Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so that's uh, um, an example of the, the dashboard uh, that you get uh, that shows you all the devices connected to your farm. Uh, this one is, we made it simple, so there's just one device that's going to be there. I'll show you an image that, uh, of something we have in prod after, so you can see a bunch of different devices <laughs> connected. Um, so at the, the top here is the, the line you want to, to be looking at. So you have a PDU here, that's a Shelly plug, it's one of those like small one per uh, dot kind of thing. Uh, you saw a picture earlier of one uh, PDU that has like eight ports, I think, or something like that. Um, so yeah, you have both options. You buy a big one and you plug a bunch of devices or you buy one per device. Um, so here it was just a, a Shelly plug, so one for um, uh, the, the dot. And right now the, the port is off. So it hasn't been turned on yet, uh, so it has no idea what's there. The, the system knows nothing. And so we're going to just press the discover button here. And um, now we get into the discovering state. So the, the first thing that happens is it turns on the, the power on that um, plug. And uh, the device is going to boot up. First thing the device is going to do uh, is going to try to connect to the network, do a DHCP request, and from that we're going to get the first bit of information we get from the, the device. The DHCP request contains um, a byte, or is it just yeah, one it's byte? Yeah, it's a single byte. Single byte, yeah. Um, that, that encodes um, a few information, and from that we get that, in this case, this is an ARM64 device, booting using UEFI and uh, TFTP for the, the, the files. And um, so um, when it's in that state, uh, that's just DHCP request gave us that information. And then um, we, in the, the response, we give it an image to, uh, through IPXC that is going to boot and is going to do some um, discovering, basically, of what's on the, the device. And um, once it goes, it's done uh, doing that first round of discovering, discovering what's on the device, we have more information now. It's not just an ARM64. It's actually a Broadcom chip, uh, BCM2711, with a VC5 GPU. So that's a Raspberry Pi 4. So we get that um, information um, from the, the discovery. And, oh, uh, I think we forgot to take a screenshot of the details. Yeah, yeah, I realized. <laughs> so we actually have a lot more information than that, which um, is exposed in the form of tags that you can use in the GitLab job. You can say, I want uh, a device that has a BCM5 GPU, for instance, and it's going to give you anything that has that. Probably not many other options that do, but uh, maybe you can say, I want a Navi21. Whatever device has a Navi21 on it, give me one of those. Um, and you have tags like that for um, what kind of CPU it is, what kind of GPU, how much RAM you have. If you have tests that need more RAM, you can say, okay, these tests only run if you have at least eight gigs of RAM. That's the kind of tags you, you get um, through the automatic discovery. Again, you don't have to, to configure anything manually. All of that just happened when clicking one button, discover. Um, so, it says training one out of 20 uh, because we want to make sure that we always get, uh, so we can boot reliably. It's not going to sometimes boot, sometimes just hang. And we want to make sure that every time we boot, we get the actual same uh, content on the, the device, all the, the sub devices. And you, um, you don't have like enumeration that sometimes works, sometimes not. So you get weird things there. It happens. So we, to make sure that this doesn't happen, uh, we have that 20 rounds of training, or it's, it's just going to boot, 
check what's on there, report it back, boot, check what's on there, etc. 20 times, and if at least 19 of those 20 times um, give you the same result, then the device is going to be ready and it's just idle, which means it's off, no power consumed, and it's waiting to receive the job. And if you want to do some maintenance or something like that, you can just press that retire button here, and now it's retired, which means it's not going to accept any jobs anymore. Um, and yeah, you can reactivate it if you want. Um, well, you probably want. Um, and like say that on a Raspberry Pi, you're not going to do that. But on an x86, like say you change the, the GPU and you, you plug another one in there. So when you click the activate button, it's going to do a quick check, which is basically the, the same thing again. It's just going to do one time this time. Um, just um, boots, enumerates all the, the devices, and updates all of the, the tags if you change the no. Navi 21 to Navi 31. No, no, not update. Just verify that nothing changed. Oh, it doesn't... No, if, it, if something changed, it's going to go back to training. Oh, right, yes. Yeah. So okay, it's yeah. just a quick check that nothing changed. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, the quick check is running. And then it's ready, and yeah, nothing changed here. Um, and so yeah, that's the the image of uh, the Keyword Studios, which is one of the the farms that we we have with a bunch of um, GPUs here. You have the generation and the the specific um, uh, GPU in that uh, generation, and then just a, a number. If you have a bunch of those, you have one, two, three, four. Um, and again, we should have taken a, a screenshot of the, the details. If you click more, you get um, all of the, the tags um, that describe um, all the details about the hardware. Yeah, and there's also more actions that you can do rather than having just a single one. So yeah. for instance, turn on the port or not right now on, on this one, uh, but it's dependent on the context. Um, yeah, and so you can see here that having the list of um, of just the name and that you can trust that this is really what is connected is really important when you're working with um, remote uh, farms. So if you're hosting your machines not at home but in a in a lab somewhere, then uh, which is you know if you have enough devices, this has to be like this. Then you have technicians working on it, and then they don't necessarily know your system or the project that you're being t that you're testing. So uh, yeah, being able to double check that they say that they did this, and then you can verify that it actually is the way it was supposed to be, that is super practical. And then um, they can also use this dashboard to verify that things are in the state that they uh, were expecting it to be. So that's, that's why the dashboard was made, really. Next. OK. Um, so the, the product is um, hosted on um, GitLab Free Desktop, GFX CI for the, the namespace. CITRON is the, the overall project, um, but one of the main uh, thing that we mentioned is boot to container. Actually, um, boot to IPXC first. If your device doesn't have IPXC supported, then you can use boot to IPXC to um, just, well, have IPXC on your device. And then from that, you can use boot to container to just say, I want that container, and it's going to download it, cache it if you have a disk or something that can do the caching locally, and uh, start it. And you can have services in the background, like monitoring and things like that. Um, and then Ciatron is the, the overall project that puts all of that together. And some people might want some of that, like just the boot to container to start that they can just reuse that component without using the, the rest of the infra. Oh, and we have an RSC channel that we just created uh, to um, for support. Like, I mean, we're going to talk when talking dev, so you can like follow along if you're interested in how we, like the development of the, the project. And uh, if you have questions when you use it or so anything like that, please come ask us uh, on that RSC channel on OFTC. Um, okay, so that was us. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, last information is that this afternoon, as you heard, just after lunch, which has been uh, pushed back a little bit, um, we're gonna have a workshop to show you how to set that up. 
if you have, so you don't have to bring anything, like you really do not need anything, you can just come, show up, and see how it is. If you have a device that you want to test, bring it along to just like really do the, the thing yourself to see how it, it is. It is very simple, you're gonna see that, so yeah. I mean, it's very simple unless it is an ARM device, but because of course, you know, you boot stuff. Uh, but yeah, if it's x86, it's, it's fully transparent and uh, Raspberry Pis are fine or things like this, but not everything is supported by boot to IPXE. But uh, yeah, we'll have three gateways that you can play with. So one of them is uh, x86 based, and then two of them are uh, rock chip based, so ARM64. And then we'll have for each of these gateways, two uh, test devices. Uh, one ARM, uh, I mean, all of them have one uh, ARM64 and uh, one x86. So, and one of them is a Steam Deck. Just saying. And uh, yeah, do you have any question? How suitable is it? Uh, no, it doesn't it, work. It's yeah. not on. Yeah, how suitable is it? Uh, to test not only the user space but on also the kernel because I see that uh, basically you boot to the yeah sorry no, uh, it's not sorry it's like it's designed for this yeah so uh, <laughs> uh, how suitable very suitable um, my in my previous job I was testing the kernel and so um, I know that it is the hardest requirements so this is uh, like that's the uh, all the knowledge that I got at Intel, like working on the Intel graphics CI, this has been like distilled down into, okay, this is what we need, and then I rebuilt everything um, in a way that would work for all the projects, not, of course, not just the kernel, but yeah. Yeah, because of what, what I saw, uh, it was uh, most, most, uh, containers and etc. cetera, and this does not really work for in kernel stuff. So how, 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 would we, how can we use it for kernel? Well, I mean, I mean, unless you have a kernel that is not Linux, then you're fine. Is that a kernel that is not Linux? No, it is Linux, of course. See, then there's no problem. It's just config options that you need to set. So, so one, one thing that we didn't mention is that the kernel that you boot there um, is downloaded um, every time. I mean, it's cached if you, you want to cache locally, but it's, it's downloaded. It's not cached. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh. My bad. Uh, but anyway, it's downloaded uh, from the network. You can just give a different URL for the whatever local build you did, you pushed uh, on some server, give the URL, and you're going to test that kernel. OK, and the second question, uh, how tight is it to IPixie? So for example, can we, uh, how hard would it be to, for us to integrate a different uh, kernel uh, sharing mechanism? So for example, uh, may, uh, this device will not have IPixie. <laughs> Yeah, um, so netbooting is just a very convenient interface. Uh, I think fastboot could be implemented, like automatic fastboot discovery. Um, what I don't want is to end up in a situation where you have to write in the config file, this is how I boot. I hate this, I don't trust myself, I don't want to do that. Uh, but I think with, uh, we were discussing uh, this with Ryan at some point, and he was saying that, yeah, we can do this with Fastboot, have this, uh, well, just based on the, the USB uh, ID, um, just figure out that this is something that is just appearing, and then use that, and yeah. So I believe that Fastboot is, uh, should be doable. Then, um, so IPXE is just something that I really appreciate, but then we also would like to have um, this Pixie Linux support from Uboot, uh, U-Boot is not as nice because it's not going to give you all the information like from the SMBIOS table. So if, um, for instance, you want to have a different kernel just for the Raspberry Pi, then you can't really tell using uh, U-Boot. It doesn't give you this information, but IPX actually allows you to send this information, so that's uh, a bit more powerful. But uh, we still want to add support for, uh, for this. So if your device is using, um, like works well with mainline, then you wouldn't have to do anything, and then U-Boot could be just the vendor one, and that would work. Uh, I wanted to add support for that for this, uh, uh, you know, workshop, but uh, <laughs> I did not have time to do that. But yeah, I mean, IPXE is not a requirement; it's just one way. Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, any plans to do video capture or remote KVM capabilities. Anything you're looking at right now? So what would you want from there? 
Well, so um, obviously you're testing GPUs and, and ultimately you would like to see what's coming out of the HDMI uh, port or maybe look at what's on a laptop screen and then being able to remotely um, just you know look at what's happening on a, on a DIT is, is, could also be interesting. Right? So this is something that uh, we were working on quite a bit with Simon in front of you, uh, working on the Google Chameleon project. So um, basically it's a like an, an ARM and FPGA board that you put next to your your dot and then you connect the HDMI or the ODB to it and then you connect it back to the dot using uh, USB or Ethernet and then you can access the frame buffers that you that were sent, get information about the info frame and shit like this. Um, if it's just um, like you want to be able to, to see what is the output uh, but just as a casual thing, then just install a KVM, like a network KVM and then like plug your test devices to that. That's what we do. Uh, but this is, uh, if you want automation, then you need to be able to control things. And then the test device itself is the most suited to to have the synchronization points. And um, and yeah, something like the Chameleon would be needed. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, the Chameleon is not readily available. It's outdated. And uh, we've been discussing about improving it for, I don't know, six, seven years. And we have plans, but then, you know, like if someone is interested in writing a lot of, uh, of Verilog or any sort of HDL and, uh, and do board design and all this, then yeah, please come and talk. <laughs> so that's something that we would like to have. But that's, yeah, that's more like for kernel testing or display testing, which I was working at Intel on, uh, but not anymore. or well, not my priority anymore. Um, so uh, does the system performs any kind of monitoring of the teeth? So if something is broken, like you know the serial cable doesn't work anymore, the system just retires automatically the the dot from testing. Do you want to answer that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, we we actually do have something like this. Um, so if it is the um, like the. Um, if it is really outright not working, then every at every single boot that we do before running any job, we verify that the state of the machine is still matching the one from the database, and that includes a test of the serial console. So we send a ping, and then we get a pong. Uh, we have a service, um, yeah, maybe it wasn't super clear from the presentation, but uh, we don't say that, hey, this serial console is attached to this particular device, right? At no point in the presentation we had to do that. That's because we have a service called Salad <laughs> that is uh, literally just looking for every single uh, serial device that is connected to the gateway, and then it's going to be uh, uh, snooping on the connection and then, oh, like the, the serial logs to figure out which machine is connected to it. So there is this little protocol that you can have in order to associate uh, the, the machine. So that's the one, that's one thing. But then after this, through the, uh, the serial uh, console, we can actually uh, um, like grep on uh, on certain strings, and then um, if, for instance, we get a kernel hang or a GPU hang or something like this, you don't have to wait for the timeout of the job. You can just reboot automatically and then uh, retry. And uh, so the way we do this is that if you want, you don't have to reuse the same kernel command line as you did for the first job, so that if you want to resume, then you can have a different command line. So, but yeah, it's not mandatory. If you don't use it, then it's just going to reuse the, the start uh, configuration. Mm -hmm. How does the configuration work for devices that don't automatically boot when powered supplied? Like you're talking about uh, attaching like a relay to the Steam Deck? Like is there any configuration required? Uh, so work? for the relay, uh, it's a funny thing that I did. I think I'm, I'm, I was pretty happy with it. It's dumb. So you have the PDU and then rather than connecting the PDU directly to the, the, the Steam Deck's power supply, you just use the power strip and then you just like bring the power to the Steam Deck and then uh, you uh, use a USB, you know, like power supply, whatever, uh, like phone uh, charger, and then you plug that to the relay so that the two of them are always in sync. 
<laughs> and luckily the uh, you know the power sequence of the of the Steam Deck or any other device really is going to be much slower than the connecting the battery. So the battery is going to be connected by the time the BIOS or the embedded controller is starting, and so it's as if the battery had been connected the entire time. Yeah. Uh, to get there took me a couple of iterations. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's dumb because it and, and but it works, so it's smart. <laughs> One thing to note about battery devices is that um, it needs to be the battery needs to stay there. I don't know if it's the case. In that oh yeah, one. that's something. Yeah, so for some devices, the performance is going to be highly affected by whether the battery is connected or not. So for some, you can just disconnect it and you're done. But uh, for most devices nowadays, you cannot just power it using USB and not have a, uh, a battery. It's going to crash or um, the, the BIOS is going to well, limit your performance of firmware. And then you were saying, like, what can we do for devices that don't boot on AC? Um, well, I have one device like this. It's not reliable. So I have a small Arduino that just uh, has a relay and then just keeps pressing the button until the power LED turns on. That's literally what it does. I mean, it's not like physically, it's electronic. But yeah, that's what it does. And I'm going to make it as its own uh, PCB that uh, people can just print uh, in using like GLPCB or whatever, so that you can order a hundred of them and then you're done. Yeah, so right now I just do it by hand because it's so small. And yeah, that would just be the like fifth iteration of this PCB, you know, <laughs> over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. Hope it wasn't too boring. <laughs> <laughs>